So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar in our Leaders in Regenerative Agriculture series, Regenerative Grazing series. Uh, and we're really honored uh, today to have Wayne Knight as our speaker. Uh, Wayne is the Executive Director of Holistic Management International. I'd like to thank Southern SARE for sponsoring this webinar, which is part of a three-year research project on understanding and overcoming barriers to the adoption of regenerative grazing in the states of Arkansas, Mississippi, Texas, and Virginia. Over 70 people are taking part in that project. And in this series, we're gonna be hearing from several of them along with many other leading thinkers and practitioners in the world of regenerative grazing. So these talks will be continuing about once a month for the next uh, two years. And everyone's always welcome to attend. They're all open to the public. Uh, this project is incidentally just one part of NCAT's Soil for Water program, which is supporting and connecting landowners and land managers all over the country who are learning together how to catch and hold more water in their soils. If you haven't been to our website, please check out the soilforwater.org. Uh, you can join our network, you can sign up for our newsletter. We'd love to have you part of that uh, community. Again, if you just joined us, we encourage you to put your uh, introduce yourself in the chat, say hello um, to others, say a little bit about where you are, maybe who you're coming, you're representing an organization, who you're representing. Um, and um, also we encourage you to put, put questions into the, into the uh, chat um, or unmute yourself and you can ask those questions uh, directly. Um, you will save a little time for questions at the end. I am gonna introduce Wayne Knight just briefly, he's going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his background. It's a pretty amazing story, and uh, I know you're all going to enjoy that. But I will just say we're really thrilled to have Holistic Management International as a, as a partner organization in our project. And for over 35 years, HMI, as I think most of you know, has been a national leader in empowering farmers and ranchers to use better grazing practices and raising awareness of the, of the power and the potential of regenerative grazing. I know Wayne's gonna go into that history a little bit. Um, I did notice, I looked at Wikipedia just a few minutes ago and, and holistic management is now being applied on over 30 million acres all around the world. So it's an important effort. It's an incredible uh, contribution. We really are grateful to HMI. Uh, we are recording this meeting and we'll leave a little time at the end for questions. Again, please go ahead and put them in the in the chat box if you like. And um, if you would go to your reactions button at the bottom and do a little uh, hand clap, please join me in welcoming Wayne Knight. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Mike, for uh, giving me this opportunity to share a bit of my story. Um, as you'll see there, um it's what is holistic management and i've called it my perspective i think uh the, as um, a recent arrival at hmi as executive director i'm learning that uh, we have a, a massive community um, all over the world and holistic means management means a lot of different things to a lot of different people so it's it's certainly my perspective, and um, what I'm wanting to introduce you all today is you know my story, my background, how I used holistic management, and why I think it is is such a valuable tool. I've got a mixed bag of photos here: some sheep um, in southern Africa, a giraffe on a recent trip, some of the workshops and places I've been working, and. Um, a, cup, a picture of my family, or me and my kids at least, um, all very much part of, of what makes the whole, um, working with others, uh, sharing experiences. I think um, coming into HMI, I've done quite a lot of interviewing and um, a constant theme is learning together. And uh, yeah. Please, um, as I'm going along, if something's unclear, um, ask a question, 
put up a hand, put a question in the in the chat box by all means. Um, I'd love to dig into or explain better if if I'm not being clear or not understood. Um, hold on a second. See, it's not advancing. Ah. So I think the place to start for me is holistic management is a management framework. That might sound odd to a lot of people who see holistic management as a, as a grazing platform or a grazing system. Uh, for me, holistic management is very much a way to make decisions. Um, I like to talk about how holistic management enables us to, to embrace complexity. It enables us to work in a, in a very complex environment um, that is ranching or farming. And um, it, it all starts with um, clarifying what's important to us. What are these things that um, are important from a financial point of view? We have to be economically viable. We have to be um, building ecology. And those two often are at odds, um, the way conventional ag works. And I think that this framework um, that uh, Alan Savory developed enables us to to work through the complexity. Um, you know, Dave Snowden has come up with this beautiful quadrant that explains, you know, chaos versus uh, a simple planning process to uh, the complex uh, or complicated environment where we bring in um, experts to help us make decisions. Um, and very few of us really embrace the the complex environment where no expert actually knows what, what the outcome is going to be. If you move your animals or graze a particular paddock in a particular way one season and you do the same thing the next year, you're going to land up with a very different result. And uh, we, we in, in managing natural systems often use um, the complex complicated model that Snowden describes and want to bring in an expert where that's not really possible. And um, for me, this framework enables us not to be right all the time, but to be on the correct path. And I'll talk quite a lot about uh, the feedback loop that's essential in, in managing complexity that I think holistic management's framework has enabled um, it reinforces this need and this um, repetition of monitoring at many different levels. So I'm gonna go through that and, and talk you through monitoring, planning, and, and how important this built-in feedback loop is. I think a difficult part of, of what we're talking about here has to do with um, the holistic context that is very much a values driven um, approach. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Simon Sinek's um, golden circle and how values drive our decisions, whether they're marketing decisions as uh, in Simon Sinek's um, golden circle example, but I think how values motivate us to do what's important in our lives and um, bringing the values comp component to a holistic goal or a holistic context um, really motivates us to be engaged and to be moving in, in this direction. Tough for farmers and ranchers to talk about a lot of the time, you know, my dad was very much in the camp of, I'm a farmer, I've got a farm to run. You, you get on with the emotional stuff, you get on with these values and, and I wanna be out farming, but it's the values and it's these, um, you know, the, the why we do things every day that if we focus on that, it, it really helps us. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about that. I must talk a little bit about ecological principles because uh, for me, the breakthrough the enabling of, of embracing complexity, unlocking that potential comes from how to interpret um, 
the, the, the land, how do we view the land and uh, learn to read it. And without understanding ecological principles, these things fall apart a little bit. So, you know, this is very much understanding what is holistic management. Um, yeah, and these planning processes, uh, I've talked a little bit about that and the monitoring. So starting here with the first um, portion of what we call the holistic management framework, nature functions in holes. Uh, this gets a lot of people a little bit confused and murky, but um, it, it, it comes up a lot in, in how we make decisions and how we are uh, educated, uh, particularly in the conventional ag environment, we don't appreciate very often the complexity involved and the long-term implication of our decisions. So technology um, is very often used as a way to, well, we have a problem, we're going to deal with the problem and let's let's get to the end of it. So a fundamental of holistic management is appreciating that if one thing changes, everything else changes at the same time. And uh, I think a lot of scientific folk really don't understand, uh, you know, this uh, holistic approach. I, I look at a lot of examples of uh, experiments set up with controls in a natural environment, particularly, let's say, a grazing environment. If you change um, one aspect of, of how a plant's utilized, everything else in the ecosystem, soil microbes, the moisture interactions, everything changes. The idea that there are constants in nature and that you can eliminate or control one thing uh, is, is something that is an anathema if you look at um, natural processes where there is this huge degree of, of uh, complexity. So the, the first line there is, you know, understanding how nature functions in holes and right alongside that is how can we observe and start understanding, reading the land, um, interpreting what's happening when we make certain decisions. And that that's, that's a complex thing to get your head around, but um, it's a very much a a fundamental of, of the approach that we're using. The next line item here is referring to the holistic goal or a holistic context. It's defining the whole in which we, we're managing and um, taking stock of what we have control over, what we have um, influence over, it encompasses um, defining where we are effective. And what I find really interesting here, um, we have a, a fantastic uh, board of directors um, for HMI, people who are really passionate about um, use, the use of holistic management. And what I find interesting is they're using it in such varied and um, different places, not always in ag even. Um, one chap, um, Josua Lamprest, who's just joined our board, he does a lot of conflict resolution and he talks about the value of identifying exactly what the, the whole under management is. He uses this complexity and def definition of holes to clarify for a family where there is conflict exactly how they fit in to maybe the business whole um, with inheritance, with um, different aspects of our lives that often get into, you know, we, we're not sure where we fit into maybe the family structure, the family business structure. He's using it in that context. Um, Brian Welberg from Australia, he works with a lot of um, ranching producers on the ground that lands up having um, quite a lot of disagreements and misunderstandings about where the boundary of a, a, a management structure works when you have different managers running different businesses. And he finds the use of defining 
which is the hole, which is the area, which is the effectiveness area um, for different members of a management team, how valuable that can be. So the application here is not necessarily just grazing, it's a lot of the people management and the, the understanding of how we fit in that that's particularly important. Um, I'm not going to dig into the holistic goal component so much at this stage. I'd like to do that a little bit later on. But um, looking at ecosystem processes, I think um, we can all um, agree that monitoring ecosystem processes is really important, making sure that we're making progress. Um, but I think um, keeping the simple, keeping the monitoring process um, at lead indicator monitoring is particularly important so that we're making decisions um, based on points that are most relevant to our next management decision. So what I'm saying here in conversations that I hear um, in the regenerative ag movement as a whole, I'm quite concerned that a lot of the the, the uh, monitoring that's happening is not, is research orientated data collection, which is fine. There's no problem with decisions um, at, or with, with monitoring with a with a scientific hat on, but I think we must be very careful not to mix up um, management uh, management monitoring and research monitoring. And I think a lot of our disagreements come from the indistinction. This is between academia and farm, farm managers, farm ranch managers is, you know, what do we need to be monitoring? If you're a researcher, you're looking at particular data to verify what, what has happened or what management implications have been. But when you're a manager, you need to be looking at lead indicator monitor, monitoring What's going to help you decide what cover crop to plant, what uh, animal moves to make, um, what investment decisions to make? Those are very different um, kinds of data that we're looking for and uh, being clear on if we're looking at ecosystem processes, what is it that's going to give us the the best indication of our next management decision? And I think holistic management really helps us to do that. Uh, moving on to this next block, it's understanding how the tools that are available to us um, influence the environment. So I'm going to dig into a little bit of this, particularly looking at animals, um, living organisms, and grazing. They all have a very different, they all nature related, but if we look at um, how different environments, uh, I'm, brittleness being less or more humid, how they respond to, to grazing and timing between perspective grazings or different grazing events, um, the Im impact of hooves and animals not really looking where they, they're running, moving. Um, this would have been in the past predator related. How, how does that differ when you're in a moist environment or in a dry environment? and trying to work out very clearly how to uh, apply tools for the best return on investment and for the best um, influence on, on the big picture. Probably, I feel like I'm going through this maybe a little too fast, but I'm trying to give you an overview so that uh, you understand these are the different components of what make up holistic management. And then I'll get into couple of the specifics as, as I move through. I've talked a little bit about this feedback loop, that if we're making decisions and we have a goal uh, that we're making decisions towards, ensuring within this complexity that we're leading in the right direction uh, is, is really, really important. And um, this newest block I've just put up, planning and monitoring processes, what um, makes holistic management so in, well, valuable to me 
is that this feedback loop is built into the financial planning, the land planning, the marketing and business planning. Each of these planning processes has this feedback loop built in. And um, because we're dealing in this complex environment, using the monitoring, using the planning processes are particularly valuable because we are constantly checking that the, the results we are hoping to achieve are actually being achieved. We, we can't just assume that. So this feedback loop relative to the planning processes being very, very important. And um, something that uh, makes holistic management pretty unique, I think, is um, testing questions that help us be honest with ourselves about where we are making decisions at a particular point in time. So often as people, we're making decisions that are financially related, for example, and then we forget about the impact that this might have on the environment. Or we're in the mindset of, we have a problem, how can we fix this problem? And we bring in a tool that um, fixes the problem in the short term but has unintended consequences. So questions like root cause, is this uh, decision uh, dealing with the root cause of the problem? I think if our politicians and um, a lot of uh, policy people look carefully at uh, the root cause question, for example, I think uh, a lot of the time we'd realize uh, this probably isn't such a good idea. Um, there, there's a lot to dig into in the testing questions. I'm putting it up there, but um, let's just say that the holistic decision testing really helps us work through complexity and unintended consequences and forces us to make uh, decisions that are ecologically sustainable and sustainable and, and, and reaching these values and um, aspirations that that help us deal and and simplify um, these complex environments that that we that we operate in I've spoken quite a lot about the whole the nature functions in holes um, but it's really you know getting away from the idea that uh, we can run experiments or do things in isolation in nature and uh, as I try to explain, families and um, individuals have an, an overlapping space, as do grass plants and animals and the, the, the microbes under the soil. Uh, they, if, if one thing changes, everything else changes, and uh, we have a tendency to, to, short, to simplify this and expect uh, the implications of our decisions to be a lot um, less or a lot more um, defined and, and not have the spillover that they actually do. Speaking to the holistic context and having a goal that you're working towards, um, for me, the standout thing about holistic management is that Alan Savory recognized that in order to function and be productive for our grandchildren's sake, if we're planning for what must be in place well into the future to sustain what we're doing, and we use a decision testing process that helps us make sure that what we do leads us in the direction and ensures that what's in place well into the future is, is there, that is true sustainability. That is true, truly making the effort to ensure that this goal of things are gonna be in place for my great grandkids and for their kids. And that's not just ecologically. Um, the future resource base is community-based and it is economically-based. 
um, in, in dealing quite a lot with conservation minded people in Southern Africa, it was always amazing to me how conservation was viewed very much as that means without people. If we can, if we have a conservation area, that means let's let's exclude the people, and nature will just sort this this problem out or sort sort things out. And um, being really honest about, well, if we have this dream of the future, we want to live by the values. We want to be honest. We want to communicate clearly. We want to be valued. Uh, we want to grow as as people. These are most no, these are values that most people can um, subscribe to and identify with. But what needs to be in place well into the future to sustain that? It means a community that gets along. It means an ecosystem that functions well, and it means an economy that is thriving, not necessarily huge material wealth, but what is enough. And what I love about the future resource base is it makes it our responsibility to make decisions that lead to that harmonious environment that our grandkids and their grandkids should have. That to me is what makes holistic management particularly powerful and particularly useful. So I've, I think I've covered um, that the future resource base is healthy ecosystem, healthy water cycle, healthy mineral cycle. And in order to do that, we need to define how this environment must be and then ensure that our observations and our monitoring of all these collective decisions that we make are heading in that direction. And then on the economic side, what are we doing day to day, month to month, year to year, that's ensuring that our local economy is thriving? A farm, a ranch, uh, isolated and not part of a functioning community is not sustainable. If we're managing for this future vision, what do we need to be doing? It's taking that role and responsibility and making it personal. What are we buying? What are we consuming? Um, getting to that level of, of understanding and community, animal community, human community, economic community, for me is quite a fundamental component to, to the whole. So as I mentioned, Simon Sidnick and the Golden Circle, he's focusing on, in a marketing environment, telling your consumer why um, what you do is so valuable. But in the holistic goal, what we're doing is we're starting out the goal with the why, with the values, with these things that are to some weak and uh, difficult to articulate, but they are known to be the most motivating components of, of our lives. We are far more in tune and far more likely to respond to uh, values that we hold deeply. And what I really appreciate about a holistic context or a holistic goal is that it starts out with these values of why we want to live, why we want to wake up in the morning, why we want to live the lives that we live. And um, by having that on a goal that we are constantly reviewing and uh, living by and making important decisions towards, we're going to be a lot more uh, motivated than the how and the what. It's a, a powerful reason to, to live by a values-based goal. So these are, this is the, the layout of a holistic goal. Um, at the top here, we've got a statement of purpose. Generally, oops, sorry. That generally means um, if we've got a business or an entity that we're running, uh, what must you do to achieve um, you know, this organization's purpose? Um, from a, for a farm, I think uh, defining 
why you are a farmer, what is the farming business there to achieve, um, that gives an organization, it gives a bunch of people involved with that organization a very clear reason. It's separate from a mission, it's because that would be more outward looking and marketing orientated, but a statement of purpose really defines why this entity is there. The values, the quality of life that we want to live by, that's a, a series or a, a list of, you know, these, these deep held um, whys in our life that are going to, that need to be there every single day for us to live by. And then this future resource base that I was describing, you know, how must the ecosystem be functioning? How must uh, our community be? What must the resources in the community be? And what must that econom economics be? And then we have these means of fulfillment or behaviors and systems for each of the statement of purpose, the values and the future resource base. What are we going to have to do day to day to achieve that? That makes up the holistic goal that, that becomes this guiding light and this um, reason for waking up in the morning, getting up and um, guiding our decisions. And then from that um, holistic goal, we then set up, um, evaluate and prioritize what are these SMART goals that we're going to achieve. So we, we're breaking this down. As I explained, holistic management to me is a, is a management framework. And it, with these are the values, moving down to these are, are the, the future resource base, these means of fulfillment or behaviors and systems that we're going to have, that we live by, that we have to do on a regular basis. Um, and then moving on to SMART goals, the strategies and the tactics and the policies that we must have in place to achieve um, this outcome. SMART goals being specific, measurable, articulated, realistic, and time bound. And from that, we, we build out our, our management framework. Um, so um, perhaps you came to this uh, discussion thinking, well, Wayne's going to be talking about um, grazing and grazing management. But uh, for me, this forms the basis of, of what holistic management is made up of. Um, the testing questions, I don't think in the time that we have available, I, I can dig into this. But um, just to say that uh, for me, the, the testing questions have saved me from uh, e extreme financial crises in South Africa in um, about 1997, interest rates in South Africa went to 28%. My father just bought a, a, a ranch um, to help me arrive and, and, and thrive in the business. And um, with the uh, new government in South Africa, the post-apartheid government, there was a lot of uncertainty. And without this um, financial planning, holistic financial planning process and these decision tests, we, were, we would certainly not have made, uh, made it through that crisis. What the, the process enabled us to do was, you can imagine, You've, you've bought a property, you now need to stock it, interest rates start climbing. I think my dad purchased the property at about 11 or 12%, which was steep. Lots of um, political uncertainty, interest rates start going crazy. And um, I remember looking, sitting in a discussion around the, the dining room table in my, my fiance back then and my house, and we're looking at, at the financials and my parents go, well, we've cut everything. We've cut our expenses so low, it's impossible. We, we can't do any better. And we use these testing questions and the, the planning process. And it really cut through, well, what do we have to do? What's the most important place to be spending money? I think the 
the the thing that really came home to us or hit us really really hard was so much of the expenditure that we we regarded as minimal or was a mental approach that we have to have this expense item there because it was part of last budget when we changed the planning process and said well here's our income here's our debt load we have to have some profit in here and we'll leave the rest <laughs> for expenses how do we bring our expenses now and allocate this portion of our income to the expensive to ensure that we can cover the debt and pay ourselves uh, with that planning process it completely changed how we viewed expenses how we allocated expenses and it enabled us to survive even 28 percent interest rates so if um I, i'd really encourage anyone who's who's interested in that process to to have a good look at it <clears throat> yeah these these testing questions give a balanced evaluation of options in terms of of your resource um by dividing um your expenses categorizing them according to whether they're going to generate wealth into the future whether they're fixing a problem in the short term or whether they're just a maintenance expense something like tax or you know land tax or something like that by categorizing that and moving as much of your expense allocation to things that are going to bring you money well into the future um that whole mental approach to 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 cost allocation and what's really needed was was an absolute breakthrough for us and um yeah i think the biggest advantage that holistic management brought to us was the realization that there is so much abundance if you start working with nature and every investment that you can make to put money into unlocking natural processes rather than achieving what we regard as management by problem solving was was the breakthrough this ability to focus on well are we going to put fertilizer out are we going to mow or are we going to put in a fence and water system that's going to yield um reduced management in the future improved um growing conditions for plants improved animal performance year after year after year when you accumulate well, repeatedly allocate funding to the place where it's most needed you suddenly sort of drive up an investment engine you 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 allocating to um decisions and resources that are are yielding you the best return for unlocking natural potential it's an incredibly liberating exciting process to be in and um it's such a under appreciated potential investment process so sounds like i'm on a hard sell here <laughs> i'm not a good salesman but this process was revolutionary to me it it fundamentally changed our, our our family structure our family business and the way we did things so it it was very powerful to us i've covered this portion of um the the understanding the ecosystem processes um just to say that when you start observing um how your land is reacting uh, kirk gadzia and i did a workshop um, in near albuquerque last week and i love how he talks about reading the land listening to what the land is telling you and um as i look at these four circles the biological community or biodiversity um the water cycle the mineral cycle and and energy flow each of these circles is making up ecosystem process it's one process that we're looking at through different eyes but 
and I, I'm a hunter and I'm a fisherman, a fly fisherman. So observation and interpretation for me are extremely exciting. And I look at this um, ecosystem monitoring very much like um, a keen observer of the land or a birder or a, I don't know, if you, if you love the outdoors, being able to see how diversity is is something you can observe changing how you can see a thriving community how you can feel it and smell it um, looking at the the soil surface um, to to observe how well the water cycle is functioning what is the impact of raindrops is there crusting happening um, how much cover is accumulating that's reducing water runoff is it better now than it was a year ago? Um, looking at the mineral cycle, how much gray material is standing out there? Bearing in mind the previous year, the previous rainfall, that what is happening with that mineral cycle? Because if you can extend or accelerate the mineral cycle, there's more potential for growth. Your water cycle is better if your mineral cycle is better. But how are you observing that breakdown? How are you observing dung decomposition, being keenly aware of these small things that actually read like a book uh, once you get to know them, that is, uh, it's rewarding financially, <laughs> it's rewarding spiritually, and um, it really helps you be in tune with, with what you're doing. It's uh, pretty hard when things aren't going in the right direction. But as soon as you recognize that things aren't going in the right direction, of course, you can change. For example, um, when I started with uh, planned grazing, um, I used 120 day recovery periods. And um, that worked really well. I had huge results. But I had a, a visit from um, other uh, colleagues, uh, holistic management educators had a meeting at my place and we were uh, always out as much as possible looking at the land and it was brought to my attention, well, Wayne, your recovery periods are too long. What was an uh, adequate recovery period of 120 days had shifted significantly in that prior few years because we had a wetter cycle, but of course the plant roots were deeper plants were reacting very, very differently with longer recovery periods. And actually my recovery periods became much too long. So I was harming animal performance because the animal, you know, because the grass was getting too stalky and seeded. So these kinds of observations really help you move forward. And um, being part of a community helps that, of course, as well. I brought in this picture of wildebeest. Obviously, it's an, an African picture, but I, I talk about it quite often because I think um, when we're talking ecosystem function and um, the origins of holistic management, it's very much in observing land and how it would have functioned when big herds of animals, of ungulates, of um, ruminants, we're moving around on our environment, um, particularly the more arid, um, drier regions of, of the world, um, hunted by pack hunting predators. Understanding that interaction is fundamental to being an effective land manager. Um, plants or grasses evolved with ungulates. Uh, they, the most recently evolved plant and understanding how these interactions between big herds of grazing animals, predators that kept them moving, the microbes in the soil that responded to these heavy grazing events, and then recovery. If we don't respect that process and understand that evolution, then we are really putting ourselves up with the constant um, Confrontation, I would say, with nature. If, if we try as well as we can 
with the resources and time that we have to emulate, to model what these wild animals did, the, the better we're going to be at um, recreating the thriving environments that our forefathers, whether they were um, people living on, on this land with wolves and buffalo, um, or with these huge herds of, of antelope in, in Southern Africa, um, and our, if, if from a European uh, colonial perspective, I know um, not everyone is, is in that colonial mindset, but um, or from that colonial past, but if you are, your forefathers brought a way of, of viewing the world, which was very likely Western European and moist environment, Western European, and um, not appreciating the importance of these huge herds that migrated across the landscape and engineered um, what, what the fundamentals are. Um, in the winter, they are the, the, the moist, warm environment in which biological decay can happen year round. Um, and this time factor between exposure to animals and uh, recovery for time for those plants to regrow before they grazed again. Those fundamentals, that holistic perspective of, of, of this interaction and the time that's so critical is hugely important to, to us being able to manage the plants that grow here, the plants that choose to grow here. Um, from my perspective, when I came to holistic management, I uh, was following theory and stories only. Right now, there's so much to back up what Savory's early experiments or observations were. Um, this, this interaction for me is, is powerful because by following um, dense grazing, as dense as I could get it, long recoveries for plants to regrow and focusing on investing in infrastructure that enabled to me to do that job of intense grazing, long recovery period, repeated investments in that meant that in time, uh, brush on my place started to die out. The invasives really didn't like that um, management, the soil composition changed and the plants that I didn't want started to disappear and the plants that I did want started to thrive. Unpacking that story, unpacking that interaction for me is, is so, so powerful. And that comes down to, we have a whole toolbox of, of different um, tools that we can apply in our day-to-day -day management which ones are the ones that are really useful and good investments, have a reliable and um, positive impact on the environment, as opposed to a lot of the technology that, that, that has a place that uh, definitely can help us overcome certain problems, but it's so overused because of our tendency to want to solve problems and go in for a quick fix and actually exacerbate the process. If we start concentrating on using uh, living organisms, animal impact, uh, recovery time, suddenly you unpacking this huge wealth and this huge capacity of nature to heal and grow and produce an excess rather than using the, the, the other tools that have um, unreliable for me, much less reliable outcomes and a lot of unintended consequences. We've got in this little graphic, uh, human creativity on the one side and money and labor on, on the other side. That's just the way we can apply these tools. I've heard some fantastic stories about the, the different application of any of the tools. If we suddenly uh, think about it differently, listen to others, hear what, what's possible, but um, really, my focus is let's let's use recovery and animals and um, living organisms as far as possible to to kickstart what's what's lacking, and the returns on that investment are spectacular.
Um, so yeah, we have all these tools. Um, we can apply labor and money and we get we, we get in a surprising return if um, we reduce the the reliance on um, on technology and yeah I want to talk about the feedback loop and I notice here I've got some an error that's supposed to be circular arrows so excuse me I don't know how that jumped in here so we, we should be going from plan to implement to monitor to control and it's it's not uh, the, the errors that are there apologies for that I talked a little bit about this um, in my introduction but if you can picture this airplane taking off from a runway and um, it, it's heads off course because the wind's blowing or there's a storm along the way the sooner the pilot can recognize that he's off track and get on to um, the, 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 the desired um, outcome, the better, far better to go along the red line, having uh, gone off course than wait for a longer period of time to get to the, to the orange and um, taking for granted that the outcome is already determined because I think a lot of people are, are flying without really a clear direction in mind. The, the metaphor here is that the holistic goal is that um, that destination and um, that monitoring towards the values that we want and the future resource base that we want, the sooner we re, re, reassess, check that our direction is correct and, and get back onto that course, the better. So in each of these fun, um, planning processes, we have feedback loops built in. Um, you using when you're putting together a financial plan or a grazing plan, you are using your holistic goal to 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 set it up. Um, so that's a filtering process already. You're testing your decisions towards the goal, and there are a number of decisions that need to be tested in each of those planning processes. So that's giving you the impetus and the direction. Um, but within that, you you replanning continually. You're assuming that because you're dealing in that uh, complex domain, as David Snowden describes, if you're dealing in that complex environment, what you do this year will certainly have a different outcome from what you did last year because the growing conditions and the way things interact are different. We assume we're going to be off track, so we, we're constantly monitoring to make sure that we're back on track. And the same goes for the land planning, um, but without the monitoring, the ecological monitoring, the financial monitoring, and some social monitoring in there, we, we're not going to be on track and we're not going to be achieving the goal that, that we've set up um, in, in the beginning. I think I've covered most of these. So yeah, just to say that uh, for me, plan grazing is about uh, achieving a number of goals. It has been about um, wanting to make the land better. Initially, <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes because I, um, I wanted to heal the land and didn't care about animal condition. And uh, in that process, slowed down the rate at which we we could have, as a family, um, made the land a lot better. It meant that we didn't have the money. We were in stress financially because the, the animal performance was off track. And um, that helped me, motivated me, forced me to, to use the holistic planning process much more comprehensively. Uh, because I was off track, um, wanting to heal, wanting to fix land at the expense of animal performance. It was a huge mistake. And um, my, my last point here is plan for what you want um, with the goal to drive you um, and a decision-making process, a whole lot of planning procedures in place. It, you are just so much more likely to live fulfilled to be able to deal with this complexity um, as, a, as a family group, as a, a business team. 
um, and, and concentrate on, on what you want rather than on what you don't want. I look at the, the money that's been put into brush encroachment uh, in, in all over the US and think, imagine what could be done if we invested that money in things that would make our management align better with how nature functions. Um, that would enable us to spend more time doing what what nature did before we got involved and, and messed things up. If we could have more density, if we could have water infrastructure, we could really do so much with uh, the resources that, that, that are out there and being spent. But if we could channel them, that would be really useful. So I'm going to go to questions now, Mike. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but. Uh... <laughs> Thanks a lot, Wayne. We do have a couple of minutes left. Um, Linda Coffey, do you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your question? You just put in the chat. Thank you for the presentation. I was trying to take notes and missed your uh, three categories of expenses. I got to generate wealth, to fix a problem. What was the third one? Well, we, we, we divide them into three categories. So it's wealth generating, there's maintenance and pretty much inescapable. So yes. yeah, I, I'd say there's a fourth class which would be habitual or wasteful, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, trying to identify those. And, and yeah, I think habitual is probably the politer one. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. The other thing was, I wondered if you would mind sharing your family's holistic goal. I think examples really help me understand how these work. Sure. Is that something you could do? I could definitely do that, yeah. I'll email it to you. Is that going to work for you, Linda? Sure. Super. Other questions? We have just a few minutes left. Uh, again, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, uh, and fire away. I, I just wanted to comment um, and and share, you know, that in in uh, having like a layered collaborative approach, um, working with managers, uh, working with even dis different personalities on projects. Um, I heard you say a few things that really stood out to me. So, um, but yeah, having a layered holistic approach. Um, and I really like that HMI encourages us to really be in touch with nature and feelings and in so many um so many places you know where we um, have an opportunity to be collaborative a lot of times we're discouraged from uh really tapping into our feelings as a resource um so thanks for highlighting that and pointing that out and encouraging people to kind of find a a way to layer our approach and find synergies in um you know, in our manage, management practices that we can share and areas where we overlap um, for growth. Um, and also I made note about having a good planning and monitoring process um, I, because I, I just think that's so important. It, it can be challenging for some, you know, um, just to collect the data and keep up with it. I'm probably one of those, but um, a lot of, well, I guess what really corresponds well to having the feelings is also having the data to help drive those decisions. So thanks for sharing um, sharing your, your practices with us. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, if I can talk to the, um, the values and um, getting on the same page, it takes quite a lot of investment to do that, to share those values and then to figure out how differing values work together. But I, I think if if you bypass that, you you don't you're just not able to tap in. You you're not able to feel that motivation that would come from investing that time. 
Um, my dad and I, starting out, <laughs> we disagreed on everything. Um, he wanted beautiful animals and I wanted beautiful land. And of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but it was the approaches and the timing. And he could see that I was damaging animal performance and that broke his heart. And you know, I was under this impression, well, we're going to have the healthy animals. We're not going to have the healthy land. And of course, it was a, a, an approach. It was what is the goal? And once we had the goal cleared up, we suddenly were in a collaborative space. And I think that was an incredible breakthrough. That was the breakthrough that allowed this two generations, pretty hard headed characters, um, both of us. Um, and uh, yeah, spending the time investing in that, well, these are our values. That wasn't difficult, but it was the approaches that, that were really pretty stunning. So thanks, Deidre, I appreciate your, your, your feedback. Uh, Gil, Gil, your word looks like you're unmuted. Did you have a question or comment for Wayne? Or maybe not. Uh, anyone else? Um, we're, we're at the end of the hour. I know folks, some need to leave, but Wayne, if you're willing to hang on for a few minutes, I'm sure people will have other uh, questions or comments. I'll just share a couple of anecdotes and uh, Wayne, I'll put a face with a name. Um, I'm the state forage extension specialist here in Virginia. And uh, years ago, I had a opportunity to ride around with the then ex uh, forage extension specialist. And he talked about how there was a lot of recreational haymaking done in Virginia. <laughs> and uh, later, I began to work with an organization, the, the Forge and Grassland Council in our state, and I uh, talked to the then president of the Forge and Grassland Council. I was not in an, in an extension position. I was just uh, trying to engage with the, the producer community. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, this guy, the, the, the former extension specialist, he had this comment. I thought, this is really great. I'll throw this at the president. And I did. I said, you know, there's a lot of recreational haymaking done in this state. He clapped back at me with probably the best comment I could have ever received. He said, yeah, but what you don't understand is it's cheaper than therapy. So I didn't have an extension position then. It would be several years until I did. But that, that, that comment was, again, I think that was the best comment he could have given me because it helped me really be careful about pushing a management approach without fully understanding motivation. Uh, and I think, you know, that's really challenging. I, mean, I can go in and say, look, you don't need to spray these weeds. You need to do a better job tightening your rotation and figuring out how to manage your herd so that they're going to eat all this stuff. You need to teach your cows. In fact, I, that's one of the statements that I try to put on my uh, extension presentations is that cows are terrible land managers. They make great land management tools. Um, but not everybody can get there. Not everybody wants to get there. And so I have to be very careful, very, you know, cautious in my approach to say, this is the way you got to do it. Right. So, right. uh, and I, and I'm sure you, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that and have had that experience. I'm just, uh, uh, sorry, I was a little bit cold here in my, my house. Um, just think that that's uh, worthy to reflect on where is it that people are coming from because you know sometimes they have trouble making moves because of family disagreements or you know what is it that we're trying to do here is not necessarily well defined they don't even know exactly what they're working on themselves and so if it's cheaper than therapy it took me a long time i thought oh that's a really great comment but it took me a long time finally now i say well why do you need therapy so anyway, <laughs> anyway things to think about <laughs> And I think, uh, John, to that point, I think that's why the goal is so essential. Uh, I think a lot of times we come at, you know, this, this is what's needed ecologically. Yes, uh, working with nature's great. It, it has potential. But if we don't start with the beginning and the goal and uh, what's important to people, we, we can't make the, the, the progress. And to your comment, well, there's family stuff happening. I think that's our number one uh, holdback uh, is 
that families have issues that are really difficult to work through. And if we can help them with an approach, and I'm not saying holistic management is the approach, it is an approach that, that uh, if embraced, can really create some movement. Um, but it's certainly not for everyone. Love um, to hear from Mr. any Gil, Can you hear me now? Yes, please yes. go ahead, Gil. Yes. Thank you. Um, wow, that was a very interesting comment on recreational haymaking. That's opened my eyes a bit because I've kind of made fun of my friends who do that. But, um, you know, you're right. They they do find it therapeutic. And um, on top of that, I need somebody out there making hay so I can buy it from them. So it, it all works out. But you know, back to the uh, earlier discussion, I think you mentioned 120-day uh, rotation. And that's what I found myself. Uh, on for the last year or so, and I guess my thinking was, you know, if 70 days is good, well, then 90 will be better, and if 90 is good, you know, why not 120? And it seemed like I'm stockpiling and, and have a lot of grass most of the time, but, you know, I am seeing the undesirables encroaching, and I've, I've been a little puzzled about it, but you know, I'm glad to hear your your comments on changing your rotation and controlling weeds better, but you know, what what concerns me a little bit in changing my rotation is, you know, suppose I go back to, you know, I have land that will support it, or a lot of land that will support it, you know, 45, 50 day rotation without any problem, but what if it gets dry? And then you don't have the stockpile, and then you you seem to be in a in a downward spiral. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, definitely. Um, I think uh, the whole standing back. Uh, I'm not sure where you are, and I'm not sure what the situations that you you're managing are. But I would say that recognizing that we managing three very different components to our businesses, our grazing businesses all the time. The one is, as you say, risk, risk of running out of grass or risk of the grass going uh, old and not very palatable or not very useful to, to the animals. The other is uh, this variable recovery growth rate um, and you know what is the right recovery? What is the right density? That interrelationship between time, density, and forage usability or digestibility, whatever you want to call it. And then the last is the ecological improvement. We, we've got to be monitoring and managing for ecological improvement, or at least make sure that we're not going backwards, as you pointed out, there's some things happening in, in your land. And it's because it's, <laughs> it's complex, sometimes your recovery periods need to be higher. Sometimes your density could be more dense with uh, longer recoveries. How do we know which way we're heading and what you're going to make mistakes is, is where I'm heading with this. It's minimizing the mistakes and understanding and observing and within that milieu we need to figure out what's the advantage of density at a particular time i'm certainly not an advocate for ultra high density all the time animal condition as you heard was a major stumbling block in in my business it's figuring that out and adjusting for well i've got a drier season I need to destock early for risk. What is the implications? It's a wetter season. I need to speed up. Um, that means I'm not going to be putting as much through the rumen. That means there's going to be more gray material. It's, it's this balancing act that you need to figure out on your land. And that means some experiments. Uh, we love the safe to fail trial, which is helping you try out high density and 
you know, this idea that you should use 50% or 30%, to me, it's misguided because animals don't use 30 or 50 or 60% of the forage. They use it all or not at all. You know, they'll use one plant completely and the plant right next to it, they won't use it all. It's very seldom that they'll graze the tops of some and the whole, you know, and you know, not, not ignore other plants. It's within this dynamic situation, this complex environment that, that we need to be mixing things up, managing for the current conditions and learning to observe. So it's, it's <laughs> I appreciate the complexity. Um, there's no answer that says, this is how you, do, you sort it out um, because the dynamics are changing continually. I know that's not maybe very helpful, but it, it's a learning process. And the, 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 the monitoring and the experimenting, I think, are, are, are very important to me. Oh, I appreciate me. that. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, even though my rotations have been longer and our, our stockpiling, of course, has been very effective, I haven't had any adverse impacts at this point. As okay. far as uh, animal can performance, um, until right now, this time of year, which for us is uh, late fall, mountains of Virginia, fescue country. Um, you know, I can see a few cows losing condition right now because the grass is tougher. And you would think with the, the frost that we've had, it would all be pretty good. Well, it's not necessarily that that older grass is, is not so good. Um, you know, at, at, at this kind of, you know, at this date and with it being as heavy as it is, but, you know, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, and that's been my experience entirely is that every field is different uh, and they're different every year and you just have to adjust. And I guess I'm, I'm doing that, but uh, I, I do think on the whole, the longer rotation has been probably a mistake and I'm, I'm going to move away from that to some extent. Thanks for okay. your help. Good, good. Is there maybe one more question? We're at almost quarter after the hour. Yeah, I'd, I'd like the, the, the caller to get, to get in touch with me because I'm curious about his situation. Since I'm here in Virginia, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more. I mean, I think we have a lot of fescue toxicosis issues that there's an interrelationship there that, we, that might be worth exploring. Fall is a pretty hard time relative to fescue toxicosis, and we don't necessarily see that. So if the caller wants to shoot me an email for somebody who's working in the environment, I'd be happy to, to take that and have some follow-up with him. Well, that the, the, great. Yeah, the email address is in the chat here in just a second with a comment that I was going to leave. We love Connections, we love people helping each other. So thank you, John, that's uh, fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Um, anything else before we wrap it up for today? Okay, well, thank you, Wayne. It's been an excellent introduction. It's a deep topic and you covered a lot of ground there and I know people um, will, uh, will wanna follow up and, and learn more. But uh, it's been great having you on the project. And again, thank you for taking the time to tell your story and introduce us to the uh, framework of holistic management. Um, so hope folks will uh, tune in. We'll continue doing these talks, roughly one, one a month, probably skip the Christmas holiday period. But please check back as we uh, feature other speakers who are willing to share their experience and their, um, their knowledge about regenerative grazing. So. Thank you all. Have a good day and a good a good holiday. You too. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays.